Um, I was just wondering, before we do actually get into the question and answer period, I have a question that I'd like to clarify, and that's just if somebody does get an information pack and they would like some help interpreting it, who do they go to to get some help understanding that? Uh, so for those of you who have received a pack, there's a covering letter in the qualification pack which sets out, this is what we're trying to achieve, this is what's included in the pack. Um, I ought to hold one up, really. So it's a covering letter, um, five, six-page report from um, TNT, which is the engineering information, including the maps. Um, I'm not sure this is going to work very well. Um, but yeah, a two-page, two three-page covering letter, um, the engineering report from Tonkin and Taylor, and a fact sheet which helps to explain how that works. In the letter, uh, it gives contact for EQC. Uh, so if it's a specific EQC question, which you know we can answer for you or we can refer to, into Tonkin and Taylor, then we will deal with that. Uh, it also gives contact details for uh, the residential advisory service, so John and his team. It also gives uh, contact details for earthquake support coordinators who we've been working with very closely in terms of what do these packs look like, what is this process doing, why are we here this evening and how do these um, sessions work. Um, and there are a few other agencies, including Cancun, um, who you could also contact. So there are a number of places you can get support. Um, Whilst John doesn't always thank me for this, I really push the Residential Advisory Service as an agency where you may have yourselves with EQC, there may be an insurer involved, you may want to talk about what do you do with your financial institution, so what, where does the bank fit into all of this, um, how do I get what I need from a council viewpoint, what goes on my limb, da 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 da. So that's where these guys can give impartial advice, which is wider than EQC. Sorry, long answer. That was great. So thank you very much. So we are going to open up the floor now for these questions. Um, Heather's just got a microphone at the back. So because it is being recorded and these questions and answers sessions um, will probably add value for other people that watch this, we do ask that you just speak into the microphone as you ask your question. Go ahead. Um, you've said that your preference is for settling on the cost of repair. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us some examples of what repair constitutes in this context. Right, okay. So I'm going to ask Virginie and potentially uh, Clint, who's sitting behind you, who's also an engineer from Tonkin and Taylor, um, to help with this as well. So whilst I can't give you absolutely how this is going to work. I can give you the principles of how we see it's going to work. And obviously, I don't know your property. Um, and therefore, we could take that part of the conversation separately afterwards. Um, at a general level, repairing increased liquefaction land damage is really going to be about how do you stiffen up that uh, non-liquefying layer under the property? How, how do you give that ground more integrity, which it's effectively lost as a result of the subsidence it suffered. So, so that's what you're trying to do. It's not about building it up necessarily, it's about strengthening it and making it more capable of supporting yeah, a property and so on and so on. So to do that, there are a number of techniques. Um, EQC has just published uh, about two weeks ago the results of a ground improvement program which involved piloting uh, a number of repair techniques around Christchurch and um, actually in Kaipoi. Um, what that did was it, it looked at a number of um, repair techniques which have been used you know, quite extensively previously, but more for commercial type properties and larger scale properties. And it looked to say, would they make sense and would they work in a residential situation here in Christchurch, given what we know? Help me out, guys. Am I going OK so far? Um, so. There were four, five, possibly six techniques for cleared sites. So they talk about piling, uh, they talk about putting in soil um, and what are they called, cement rafts, and, and therefore finding ways of giving that, that cleared site more strength. Um, if that's the situation for a person's property and we believe that's the way they want to go, i.e. they want to do a repair, then we will work with them to identify which is the most appropriate way to carry out that repair and help with understanding the costing of that. 
and that, as I say, generally for cleared sites is, is the approach we would take. There are issues with practicality, even with cleared sites, because some of these repairs require some pretty hefty equipment um, and machinery to get them done, and therefore access to some sites is just physically not possible. So there may be some issues about whether it can be done. There are certainly a number of ways it can be done, and, and we would work through them. That's probably the good news. Um, if we're talking about a situation where the property is still there, so an in-situ property, then there's only really one um, improvement process that was trialled um, by EQC, and that was horizontal soil beams. Horizontal soil mixing, horizontal soil beams. And what you're really doing there is you're, you're drilling under the property and you're putting cement, um, cement beams through the ground under the property and therefore giving it that more um, strength. Um, that's relatively more um, innovative technology, particularly in a residential space. Again, you're going to need room around the property from a practical viewpoint. Um, and it has some challenges around what sort of soil conditions would support that sort of technology. Where's the groundwater table? Um, but as a, as a solution, it may be possible, um, but it's likely to be tricky. Um, would you like to add to that? So what we would do in those circumstances, again, is we'd need to have a conversation um, with the owner of the property to say, if that is an approach that you want to consider, we'd, we would need to understand, one, could we get it consented? Um, would it be practical from a, can it physically be done and does it actually make sense to do? Um, and then there's obviously an economics question because horizontal soil beams are an expensive repair technique currently. Does that help? Do you want to put some slides? Um, I was just going to add to that and say that, you know, on the point of building up, so building up isn't an option, um, simply because when you get an earthquake, it's like sifting flour. So if you build up, everything tries to re-level itself. Um, so the only option is to go below the ground and try and strengthen that, because um, that's a question we get quite often, is why can't we just create a bigger crust by, you know, building a metre or two up? But, yeah, the engineering around that is just not not really possible. Are you saying then that if the, if the land isn't already clear, so your house is still on it, and if you don't have room around the house to be able to put the cement beams underneath, that you can't actually do anything to, to fix it? Pretty much, yeah. That's, um, Unless you're willing to, yeah, clear the site, but then the cost around that generally isn't, it then means that it's not practical. Um, yeah, and so that's why EQC have been exploring the second option, which maybe you can talk about that, yeah. So that's where we say, if we can, we will look at compensation, which does recognise the cost of the repair. And if we can't, and realistically, there are more properties um, with ILV in Christchurch where it's unlikely that we'll be able to do a repair. Um, then we go into this diminution of value. So how that would work is, and I'm going to get told off when I get back to the office for talking about settlement now in front of, in front of the presentation. How that will work in practice will be very similar to how it's working on increased flooding vulnerability claims. So what we do is we say, what is a reasonable value for the property prior to the earthquake series. So on the 3rd of September 2010, what would that property on that site, as it stood, be worth? So we get a pre-quake value. What we then do with our uh, valuer um, experts, and we haven't really talked about that this evening, hence they're not here. Um, what they then do is they assess um, based on a whole um, series of inputs from Tonkin and Taylor from an engineering viewpoint. What's a what's a, a realistic discount on that pre-quake value to recognise the damage that's occurred? So it's compensation for a loss of value. Um, that's where we will go if there isn't an ability uh, to cost a repair on a property. 
Now that's going to be individual property by property. There will need to be conversations with people to understand exactly how that looks. And EQC will obviously be providing uh, a, a degree of support on whether it's a repair or whether it's DOV. But that's realistically into next year. Can I just ask one more question then? If, if that's the case and um, you get compensation without being able to remediate, what is, it, is your property safe and what risk uh, does it present for another earthquake? Apart from the liquefaction, you know, is it, is it going to be safe for your family to live in, I mean? So if a property is fundamentally not safe, then we've probably got a different conversation going to whether there's just increased liquefaction vulnerability. That's going to have got the property almost certainly into red zone and, and, and all of those types of things. So increased liquefaction vulnerability is recognising the um, susceptibility, if I can put it that way, of that property to damage in a future event. So inherently the property is safe, um, but it has got less integrity as a result of the land having subsided and therefore lo losing some of its strength. So we're trying to recognise, can we help people by fixing it? And if we can't, then we're trying to help them by recognising the property is probably worth less than it was. Um, I think there's a follow-up question in there, so I'm going to take the opportunity and go there. Um, if we pay a cash settlement to you on the basis of a cost of repair, then you will be expected to repair. And that's the way it works with other uh, compensation from EQC. And then your property is in a better condition for that future event, should it occur. Um, if we pay on the basis of a diminution in value, then clearly we're recognizing there isn't a repair option. So therefore, when that money is received by you, that's money that you can choose how you might want to use. Thank you.